Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, SOFI webinar series. Uh, I'm, I will be your host. My name is Eric Geisels. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, hosting a webinar presented by Marcelo Medeiros. I think he might be our first um, Brazilian speaker uh, from Pontifical Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Marcelo is going to talk about a paper on bridging factor and sparse models. And uh, his discussant will be Michele Lenza from the European Central Bank, who has himself worked on a, notably a paper with the title The Illusion of Sparsity. So this will be an interesting conversation between the two of them. Um, we will have uh, this recorded session until 12 p.m. Um, please feel free to write questions in the chat. We will have the presentation by Marcelo first and then the discuss discussion by Michele, and then we will leave some time for our Q&A. Uh, please feel free to join us during an informal talk also after uh, the webinar, uh, which will start at 12 noon. Uh, Marcelo, it's all yours. Um, I'm glad to have you as our speaker today, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric, for the nice introduction, and thank you also, Eric, Katia, and Dasheng for putting this uh, seminar together. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. In fact, I think I'm the second Brazilian. Caio Almeida was the first one. Here. Oh, that's true. I'm yeah, sorry for it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> So let me share my screen. I hope everyone can see it. Uh, okay, so in fact, the, the paper as tells every, the title of the paper is quite informative. What we want to do is to put together factor and sparse model. Uh, this paper is written, uh, has been written with Jenching Fun from Orphe at Princeton and Ricardo Mazzini, a former student who is now at the Center of Statistics and Machine Learning at Princeton. And I'd like to take the opportunity that Michele will be the discussant to say that uh, this paper um, was inspired, the idea to write this paper was inspired by uh, his paper joined with Domenico and Giorgio in Econometrica, The Illusion of Sparsity. So it was a great paper who which inspired us to, to come up with this one here, okay? Uh, so, of course, there's this big data boom in economics, several uh, papers, several authors talking about that. And when we have such a large amount of data, standard econometric methods will fail to handle uh, such data because we have curse of the dimensionality and there's a lot of usually testing and model selection going on. And then we have like post-model selection uh, issues that becomes worse uh, with big data, okay? And the solution okay, is to develop new high-dimensional statistical uh, and machine learning uh, methods, okay? Both from the frequentist perspective, the classical or the, the Bayesian perspective, okay? So we have like penalized uh, regressions, linear and nonlinear factor models and several like other approaches, also nonlinear approaches like tree-based models or deep and shallow uh, neural networks. There are some uh, reviews uh, on, the, on the topic, okay? Um, so what's the idea here? So let me give some motivation. Assume that we have a collection of, of variables, okay? So we have N variables that we group in this, uh, vector x, okay? And we want to uncover relations among the elements of x, uh, given that we have a sample of size t, okay? So we have t observations of n variables. So what we may mean by relation can be uh, how one of the variables is related to the other variables, like a linear regression of x1 on all the other axes, uh, we may be interested in the covariance structure of the axis or the partial covariance structure of the axis, okay? So we, we want to see how uh, these variables are related uh, to each other. We may have one specific variable that's our target, and we want to see how this specific variable is related to all the others, or we can 
think about, okay, let, let me try to say something about the covariance matrix of X, okay? And when, when N, uh, the number of variables is larger than the sample size that we have in this kind of high dimension setup, we need to impose some restrictions, okay? So we need some low dimension uh, structure uh, we have, that we have to impose in, in order to, uh, to, to estimate models and to conduct inference. So there are possible uh, low dimension structures. We can go to a factor model that they call like the dense, like all, all variables matter. And we are going to uh, summarize the information uh, that we have from all these variables in a smaller number of factors, okay? So we reduce the dimension of the problem by saying, okay, all variables matter, but we can uh, summarize the information in a much smaller group of factors, okay? And of course, there are this paper by 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 Anang and Halling, Leap and Heikling and Forney and, and, and others that I apologize for not, uh, if I miss some, someone here in the list, okay? The other approach that seems to be on the other, um, the other uh, side of the spectrum is like to consider sparse models, like or approximate sparse models. Okay? And this means that not, a, not all variables are important. So if I want to uncover the relation from a target variable, let's say x1, okay, and what's the how all the other n plus n minus one variables, all the other x's, okay, uh, drives the dynamics of x1. When I say that the model is sparse, what I would have to impose that not all n minus one variables matter, but just a very small subset. Uh, of those variables, so that's sparsity. And so, in one, on one side of the spectrum, we have like factor models, density. All, all variables are important, and we can summarize the information with a small number of factors. On the other side of the spectrum, we say that not all the variables matter; just a small subset uh, of those variables really matter. And there are some papers on, on this topic. Okay? And so that's a big debate, like density of sparsity. Some people prefer factor models, some people prefer like penalized regressions. There's, as I mentioned, the, this great paper by Cianoni, Lenz, and Trimicetti in Econometrica uh, last year, with a very vast uh, study, point out to the evidence that density matters, okay? Um, there's another paper that's less unknown, uh, from two Brazilians, Edibert Lopez and his student, that arrived at a different conclusion that sparsity is, is, is better. So it's, there's sparsity may be more important than density. So what is going to be our take here is that we can combine both. Okay? We can have both uh, penalized regression and factor models uh, playing a role in our modeling strategy, okay? So we are going to use, let's say, all available information, okay? So what we do in, in this paper, we have like two like major contributions. So one is a very simple uh, way to unify factor in sparse model, okay? It's a stepwise methodology. If you, so if you want to construct a model, if you have like a variable, why, and you have a bunch of regressors, you don't know which regressors you should use to, to predict why, to explain the behavior of why. And usually you have to face this decision, should I go to a factor model or should I go to a lasso regression? What we are going to uh, provide here is a way to use both things, okay? And explore the best of the two worlds. So this will be our, going, our modeling strategy. And from the inferential part, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, that we may be interested on the structure on covariance matrix, we are going um, to provide joint with this uh, methodology 
uh, hypothesis tests to test hypotheses on a large dimension covariance matrix and a large dimension partial covariance matrix, okay? And there'll be some difficulties uh, to develop the theory uh, for those tests as are going to be clear uh, during, during the talk. Okay, so these are the kind of the two contributions. The, the methodology, like the, the stepwise methodology to estimate the model and uh, a, a test uh, to conduct inference on covariance structures that will be directly related to the modeling strategy that we have in mind. And of course, everything will be done in high dimensions. When I mean high dimensions, just in the situation where n, the number of variables, uh, is much larger than the number of observations, okay? So why do we care about this? Of course, if you want to do like now casting, forecasting high dimensions, it would be nice to have a framework that we can use all available information and that we, we don't need to make uh, decisions in the first place about if we want a sparse or, uh, an, or a dense model, okay? And this relate, of course, to the Stock and Watson literature uh, on uh, diffusion indexes and 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 everything uh, that came after it. Okay? It can be used like to construct counterfactuals with aggregate data, something more on causal inference. We have uh, a joint paper that uses our methodology to construct counterfactual that's forthcoming in JASA. Okay. Uh, after this talk, if anyone is interested on that, we, I can discuss a little bit about this point, okay? And of course, we can estimate partial covariance networks to understand like hidden links among variables. And those variables can be, for instance, firms uh, that you, we want after taking uh, like systematic risk, uh, how firms are connected if they are at all. And, so this is related to the several papers um, by Mark Hallan, uh, Christian Brownlees, and Matthew uh, Barigosi. Okay? So uh, let us um, move uh, a little bit further and look at the model. So imagine that we have like those variables uh, in a factor model, just to set up notation, you can write X equals lambda F, uh, the vector u here is uh, the idiosyncratics. These are the loadings. And this is the uh, unobserved factors that we assume to be r dimension, okay? And r in general is much less uh, than, much smaller than n, okay? And so in matrix notation, we can write like x equals capital lambda f plus u, okay? Um, we can have an exact factor model, uh, which requires that the covariance matrix of uh, the idiosyncratic is diagonal, or it can have a kind of generalized factor model that lets that sigma to be unspecified. Okay? Uh, the, the key thing is that we have this uh, low hang, full hang decomposition um, of the covariance matrix of X. So that's the idea behind factor models. So the, the idea is that we have a, a factor that's strong enough to capture most of the covariance and what's left for the idiosyncratics is not that strong. There's not much uh, covariance left. Of course, we can have weak factor models. I'm going to discuss a little bit more about that uh, in a couple of slides, but basically the setup here, uh, this, the, the default setup is that we have a, a strong factor model factor that's really informative about the dependencies uh, across variables. Okay. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, we have the sparse model. So if we assume that all the variables but the i variable, we can uh, write that x minus i. And if we want to look what's the projection of xi on all the other variables, and call the coefficient of this, uh, of this projection beta i, okay? Um, the typical sparsity assumptions that most of the elements of beta i uh, equal to zero, 
So that's kind of strict sparsity. So just a few of them are really different from zero, or we can have a weak sparsity so that the LQ norm of the betas is much smaller than n. Okay, so in this case, not all the variables matter. Okay? And these sort of restrictions, of course, translates into direct restrictions uh, on the omega matrix. Just to recall, omega is the covariance matrix of the data of the axis. Okay. Um, so why we want to combine both? So suppose that we are in this very unrealistic and hypothetical uh, situation where we observe both the factors and the idiosyncratics, but the idiosyncratic with respect to unit i, okay? So you have like all the other n minus one idiosyncratics. And we want to decide among three models, m1, m2, and m3, which one is the best predictor in terms of MSC for xi. So we have like model one that we condition on all the other axes. We have M2 that condition, conditions just on the factor. So we ignore the idiosyncratics. And there's an M3 where we have the factors and the uh, idiosyncratics for all the others, okay? So M1 or M2? Of course, this will depend on the magnitude of sigma, the covariance matrix of the idiosyncratics, and assuming that these uh, factors uh, have uh, a covariance matrix that's an identity that will be related. We need to see how sigma is related to lambda lambda transpose. Okay? And you can have like M1 or M2 depending on that. But one thing that we know is that since the sigma algebra uh, of x minus i and the sigma algebra of R f is contained in the sigma algebra of where we have observed, where we observe both f and u minus i, the MSC on model three will be less or equal the minimum between MSC of model one and model two. So in a hypothetical world, we would like to have the factors and the U, okay? And, and why we, uh, we can do that, that would be better than like M1 is because in this, if we this decomposition, if we have to estimate this condition expectation, instead of making assumptions that make our estimation process uh, feasible in high dimensions. We, instead of making assumptions on X, we can make assumptions on F on U, like sparsity assumptions for instance, on U instead of on X, okay? Of course, this is very hypothetical because we do not observe F and you do not observe U. So we have to estimate those quantities. And this is all about, uh, all about this that the, the, this paper uh, will, will talk, okay? The same is true if we consider a linear projection. So let me uh, now move into uh, the method, okay? So let's now formalize the data, okay? Now, instead of just observing X, we are assuming that we can observe another set of variables, W, okay? And this W is a K-dimensional vector of observables, okay? Can be deterministic, can be random, okay? And here I'm going to consider W to be random. And we have this model here that we have uh, an X that we observe, a W then that we observe, an F, a factor that's not observed, and U that's not observed, okay? So we can interpret like this, that we have these observed, can be observed factors, so the W can be observed factors. Um, F is like unobserved, so something else. And, and we have the idiosyncratics. And here we say that what we want is to estimate this model by taking into account the potential dependence that we may have among these units here. We want to explore structure in, on the idiosyncratics, okay? So an example 
um, for, in finance, for instance, X can be a set of returns of firms. W can be a FAMA French type of factors. Okay? And imagine that F is any additional factor that we do not explicitly include on W, so that we do not observe. So imagine that we have under specified the number of factors over this factor zoo that we have now. And we want to let this data depend and let the data tell uh, which kind of factor structure uh, remains in the, in, in, in the data. And we can have this term here, okay? And we have the, the rest. So that's the kind of the, the model that we have in mind, okay? Uh, and we call R the, uh, the residual after removing uh, this part here. Okay? So R is lambda F plus U. So this model can be relaxed in several dimensions. What I'm going to present here is like a take on prediction forecasting, okay? So we are not taking any possible endogeneity um, between uh, W and F, okay? So we are taking a pure uh, predictive perspective, uh, but our results can be relaxed uh, in a way that gamma uh, has a causal interpretation so we can adapt the methodology to use of with IV or Bezeran's uh, CC uh, estimator, okay? Uh, we can make, of course, the relation with W nonlinear, but we are taking here a linear approach. We impose the dimension of W is finite. Uh, this can be relaxed, but we don't think that makes sense because what we want to leave all the uh, large dimension structure on, on the idiosyncratics. So, we take uh, W as a finite dimension. Okay? And we can, with this model, construct a predictor to X, given W, F, and all the other idiosyncratics. Okay? So a typical uh, principal component regression will focus on, on these two here. Okay? Uh, what we are saying that we are going to include this uh, extra term here in, in, in the model, explicitly in the model, how these things uh, relate. So we can use this like for macro and financial forecasting. And again, they're directly related uh, to the diffusion index uh, models. Okay? We can also think about well, what's the partial covariance of U? So use the idiosyncratic. So after we remove like those factors, okay, so imagine the example of firms, of returns, uh, firm returns. So imagine that you, you the factors represent like the system, uh, systematic risk. So you, you remove these, you, you remove these common factors that can be like the firm of French or any other factors of your choice, plus some data driven factors, okay? So we have like the Ws and the Fs, you remove these from the data so you have like the idiosyncratic returns and you want to see how firms are related. Is there still uh, some relation among, among firms, okay? So we call this kind of network uh, discovery. And to, do, to test hypothesis on that object, we can test hypothesis on the covariance matrix uh, of the idiosyncratics that we call sigma. And we can test the hypothesis on the covariance on the partial covariance matrix um, of, of, of the idiosyncratics that we call phi. There are many tests for sigma, not so many for phi. But here there's another thing that we want to test the covariance structure over U, right? The, through the population idiosyncratic uh, components. But this is an unobserved quantity. We do not observe U. So we have to use u hat to construct the test. And u hat depends on two estimation. Uh, the first estimation that's to remove w from the model and a second estimation that's to construct the factors. So to derive the relevant asymptotic theory uh, and to derive the test statistics and the asymptotic distribution for this 
test statistics, we have to take into account that there's a lot of uh, estimation going on previously. Okay? So this is kind of the main difficulty in terms of uh, theoretical achievements in the paper. Okay? So what's the methodology? It's very, very simple. First thing you do, uh, pick your um, preferred method and estimate the relation between X and W. Okay. Here, as I told you, I'm assuming that we are in a pure predictive approach, so we can do with least squares. So we just run regressions of X and Y and on W and compute the estimates for R, the, the compute the residuals. Okay. Then what we do, we run principal component analysis on uh, these, those residuals. So here we are assuming a strong factor and we have a static factor, okay? Can this be generalized? Can we move into uh, dynamic factors? In fact, uh, Matteo Barigosi has a very nice paper where he um, his co-authors and him uh, are generalizing, like it's not exact the same methodology, but something with the same flavor uh, where the factors are dynamic. Uh, weak factor models can be a little bit trickier. Uh, we are now thinking about this, uh, but here, uh, my apology to anyone who likes uh, weak factor models, we are going to keep the strong factor model approach. Okay? And then we have the third step that if we want a static model, okay, just like the covariance of the idiosyncratics, uh, we are going to do like this regression. Okay, so basically we run a lasso regression of each idiosyncratic on all the others. And of course here we need some sparsity, but our sparsity assumption is on the idiosyncratic. So after we filtered all the density here, okay. And so this is one possibility. We can also have on the third step, okay, like a VAR, on the, uh, sorry, theta, no, not about that. A var on the use, sorry. Okay, and estimate a var over the idiosyncratic. So we can, we can do both uh, and the, the last theory uh, will follow, okay, so that's, that's the idea, very simple. Okay? And then we can have uh, our final response uh, function given by all the estimated uh, quantities. Okay? And, and then again, we use lasso in the third stage uh, because we are just focused on prediction. Uh, we can use other regularization methods such as uh, adaptive lasso as well. So this is the method. Now, the uh, test, like the, the test that we are going to merge with this methodology. First, we need an estimator for the covariance matrix, okay? There are many uh, uh, estimators uh, in, in high dimensions, okay? Here, because we, we just need a consistent estimator, we don't need a, a, a a positive definite one, because uh, we just want to do the test. Uh, we consider the, the simplest uh, estimator as possible. That's, that's just this one here for each element of the covariance matrix. Okay, so that's the simplest inform estimator possible. You can use others, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, we keep this one. And for the partial covariance uh, matrix, then we have another estimator that's again, very simple, but instead of use, looking at the use, we have these V hats here. And these V hats, uh, the VIJ is the residual of the lasso regression of UI onto U minus I minus J. So we are regressing UI on all the other idiosyncratics apart from IJ. 
and then we compute the covariance matrix on this filtered uh, data, on this filtered results. And this is a consistent estimator for the partial covariance matrix. And the test, uh, we are going to do a kind of Gaussian approximation uh, bootstrap. So we test H naught that sigma equals to sigma naught, that can be phi equals to sigma uh, naught. And we are going to use the statistics that S is square root T of the subnorm of uh, sigma hat minus sigma naught. Okay? And for this test, we'll need a longer run covariance matrix uh, of this, uh, ve the, vec the vectorized outer product of the idiosyncratic. So this is a complication because we need kind of a, a new West type uh, of estimator in, in, in high dimensions, okay? And what we are going to do is that our, we are going to compare uh, our test statistics with uh, the alpha quantiles of this uh, Gaussian bootstrap estimator. So we are going to take the subnorm um, of this variable Z star and Z star condition on X and W is just a normal uh, uh, vector zero mean and covariance matrix upsilon hat, uh, which upsilon hat is the estimator of the long run covariance matrix of this quantity, okay? Um, and then we can test general uh, structure over the partial covariance and the uh, and the covariance matrix of the idiosyncratics. And this is inspired by the Gaussian approximation that was proposed by Chernuzkov, Cheveritov, and Kato. Uh, let me go. Uh, I have like about a little bit less than ten minutes, so let me go briefly to show you the theoretical results that are. They are very technical. I just want to give you the overall idea, and then I'm going to. I will have time just to go through one uh, one application uh, here, and but I think we'll give you the idea of the method. Okay. So first of all, there's a lot of pre-estimation going on, so we must be able to control for the accumulated sampling error for each step. Okay, and we have to. We want to do this uniformly in I and T. So that's the first challenge. Uh, the second challenge that the inference is in a high dimension object with serial dependence. So we need this Gaussian approximation for dependent data. And we need like the large high dimension new West estimator also. Okay? So these are kind of the main, main challenges that we face. So basically we assume um, that the data is a strong mixing process, okay? And, and in the paper, we write everything in terms of Wallex norm. So usually if you are familiar with the high dimension uh, literature, either uh, people develop everything under the assumption of uh, sub-exponential uh, tails of the distributions, and then we have this result that variables can grow exponentially uh, with the sample size. And then you repeat the same uh, developments that derive the same results under the assumption of poly, sub, uh, sub polynomial tails, and then variables can grow at a polynomial rate. Um, here we adopt this strategy to write everything in terms of Horlick's norm. So in the paper, you have a very general result that serves for both cases, and then we, you can specialize. Here for sake of clarity and to avoid a very cumbersome notation, I'm going to take a, to talk about the sub-exponential case, okay? The, the sub, sorry, the sub-Gaussian case. Okay? Um, so we have like standard strong factor model assumptions. I'm going to skip these assumptions for a moment. Uh, let me go. To just to the res to the results. So first thing that we have to do is to run progressions of x on each w. So we are going to run as many as n regressions, right? Because we have to each variable, and we are regressing on the uh, uh, r uh, variables that are the number of variables that we have, and we have this factor structure. Okay, so we can bound. The, the norm 
the, the subnorm of the errors of the first stage by this quantity here. Okay? This is basically if we use OLS in the first stage. If we use other uh, approaches, what's going to change is this order of convergence. Okay? So the first stage introduced this um, convergence rate here. Okay? When we move to the second stage, that's to run a PCA, and if we write, we write that the convergence rate of the first step is omega, this omega will show up in the convergence rates for the other quantity, or for the second step. The estimation of the factors, the loadings, and the idiosyncratics, okay? If we don't have the first stage, then this omega is zero, and we get back to the standard results. And the same thing will happen if we, when we go to the third stage running a lasso, if the second stage we have a rate that's eta, this eta will show up uh, here, okay? So it uh, appears uh, on the third stage. If we don't, if we are running the lasso directly on the data, so eta is zero and we, uh, we get back to the usual results in the high dimension penalized regression uh, approach, okay? Uh, so we can also derive bounds for the prediction errors. This is kind of maybe the main, uh, the main result that we can bound uh, this prediction error. Of course, this is very general, but then you, you can, for different setups, you can work out uh, to show uh, when will be the case that those things will go to zero or not. Okay? And we also show, now I'm running out of time, I have like four minutes, um, results concerning uh, the test. Basically we show that the Gaussian approximation works. And then we have like simulations in the paper uh, showing that the tests uh, have good size and power properties, okay? Let me briefly, show you one empirical application, okay? So the idea is to uncover network structure in asset returns after we remove factors, okay? So we have like monthly close to close access returns from more than 9,000 firms from 1991 to 2080. We have 16 uh, monthly factors, okay? Uh, we can discuss later why those 16, okay? Uh, the firms are grouped into 20 industry sectors. And if we, for instance, I cannot show like the covariance matrix of 9,000 firms, so I pick up some, some uh, sectors. So this is the correlations, okay, uh, for uh, the sectors, some of the sectors for the raw data without taking any factor out. So you see here, I hope you can see because uh, that's pretty dense. Maybe apart from petroleum, uh, it's a pretty dense uh, correlation, okay? So there's a lot of dependence on the data. If we remove the 16 uh, factors, okay? Um, you see some density in a couple of, of sectors in others like financials, basically the diagonal here, retail, the diagonal manufacturing, there are some dots um, outside the main diagonal, but it's pretty much a diagonal matrix, but there's still some structure. So let's see, maybe I, uh, the, the factors are underrepresented, so let's take the PCA on that. So if we take the PCA, things do not change much. It's almost the same thing. If it, in some case, I think it even, have more correlation in the end, okay? So the question is, uh, what is driving these uh, remaining uh, correlations, okay? So what we're going to do is to look at the partial uh, covariance matrix of the idiosyncratics. When we look to the partial covariance matrix of the idiosyncratics, basically everything disappear. So there is something going on here. There's a signal that's driving this dependence. So one thing that comes to mind is like, oh, maybe it's a industry factor that we haven't 
put in the model that's driving this. So let, let's use the methodology to try to uncover what is this industry factor. So basically in this plot here, I'm taking each, because what I'm going to do is take the idiosyncratic return for each firm and regress on the idiosyncratics of all the other firms, okay? So I'm going to group all the firms in the mining sector and I'm going to look at what's the frequency of non-zero coefficient related to variables in the mining sector or in the food sector, apparel sector, paper sector, so on and so forth. Okay? And of course, this will be uh, controlled by the number of firms in each sector, right? Because otherwise you have a sector that has way more variables more firms than the others. This will be unbalanced, so we are controlling for that. And in the end, what you can see here with this yellow column is that financial sector is basically loading on all the other uh, sectors. Okay? And we claim that this is the signal that's kind of making the covariance not sparse, even or, or not diagonal, even after taking the factors. Okay. So there's a lot of more to talk and discuss about, about these uh, in the papers, just an illustration, but I think I run out of uh, time here. So let me uh, conclude. Uh, let me go to the conclusion. Uh, so we propose a methodology to bridge the gap between factor models and sparsity using full information. So we are going to use the best of the, of the two worlds. We have new inference results in high dimension to explore covariance structure, and we have applications to forecast net, uh, network structure treatment effects. Thank you uh, very much. I will leave now the floor to Michele. Thank you, Marcelo, for a great presentation. Um, Michele, uh, please share your screen. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you. So first of all, let me, let me thank uh, Eric for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, I had not noticed it and I'm really glad that now that I've read this paper with attention. I really love the paper. Uh, let me see if I manage to scroll the slides. Okay. So in, in traditional factor model literature, we are mostly focused on exploiting common components. And, uh, you know, but over the last decade, uh, it seems that uh, probably because of the increased availability of granular data, but also for ongoing development in you know, how to handle uh, big data, uh, we aim now to more and more better characterize and exploit uh, idiosyncratic components. For example, there is this literature on granular instrumental variable, large multi-country models. They are all instances of this, uh, of this idea. Now, what this paper does is to try, um, you know, to start from the idea that idiosyncratic component are less cross-correlated than common component. However, they still may uh, display some economically and statistically relevant correlation, which can be used uh, to improve forecast or for structural analysis purposes. And the paper proposes a model that is called farm predict model, which basically goes through three stages uh, estimation. So in the first stage, there is a regression of the variables on some observed factors which in this uh, version of the paper, they are more like technical things like seasonal components or potentially trends and so on. Uh, then in the second stage, it uses the regression of the first stage to estimate the latent factors and the loading. So the variable on the latent factors. And then on the third stage, this is where, you know, this new idea of this cross-correlated geosyncratic component comes in. There is a regression of the residuals of the first and second stage on a potentially low dimensional set of residuals of other variables via, you know, this lasso uh, um, regression. Um, so what the contribution of this paper is, yes, it is these two contributions that Mar Marcelo highlighted. I have to say that the idea of better capturing local correlation is already key to a few uh, different applications. For example, here, I put something which is totally related from what Mar Mar Marcelo is doing, is more in the VAR uh, uh, literature. And there are multi-country models that exactly try to do this. You know, there is the global component, and then there is the local component, which is the country one, which is of course relevant, and this model want to capture it. So these are, for example, hierarchical factor model or uh, global VARs, so-called GVARs, or even just unrestricted large Bayesian VARs. 
Now, compared to the other models in the, or the other methods in the literature in different uh, strands of the literature, the work of Marcelo and co authors is probably a little bit more generous in terms of which kind of local correlations you can capture because it doesn't depend on a categorization. It's not that you, you have a local correlation because of country or because of groups, like, for example, in the work of Eric and in the uh, group Lasso literature in general. Now, there is a very similar paper in terms of the methodology, uh, like just the, the first contribution of what uh, Marcel is talking about by Matteo Luciani in 2014, which has a two-stage uh, two stage model. First one in which there is the factor model part, there there are all latent, and the second stage in which there is lasso. However, in that paper, there is no derivation of the inferential theory. And this, I think, is a massive contribution of this paper. Because, you know, this paper really shows us that despite the fact that you have generated the regressor, you can still uh, consistently estimate the factors. And then it gives us the tools, even with this generated regression, to test whether there is still local correlation. And effectively, this is a great ground to test the degree of sparsity slash density of economic data. You can do much more than that, but I just wanted to highlight some of the reasons why this inferential theory is really good and important. Now, let me start with some very sparse considerations on uh, that they came to my mind when I was reading the paper. First, uh, you know, probably because it's easier to derive inferential theory in that, set, in that uh, setup, the model, the method seems to work, inferentially speaking, with trend stationary data. So these WT, these observed things are not really allowing uh, or you know, they are not taught to capture non-stationarity or, or a stochastic nature. So one question is, uh, you know, how difficult it is to, to, uh, to evolve in that direction, actually because uh, the literature on factor models is now evolving in that direction, you know, allowing for I1 common component, but also idiosyncratic component. So would it really be uh, possible to do this uh, with the tools that Marcelo and, and co-authors have, have developed? Um, second point uh, about whether this empirical applications. So what do these empirical applications in the paper tell us about the density versus sparsity debate? And now when I read the results, actually it seems to me that what Marcelo and co-authors are actually coming up with is uh, that there is actually more density than it meets the eye of a standard factor model. Because not only there are these factors which are relevant, either observed or unobserved, but even after having looked at fa a factor model, which is already a dense representation of the data, there is even more correlation to be exploited. And this correlation is really relevant because it improves the forecast if you take them into account. For example, in the macro forecasting exercise, uh, PCA regressions and even more the farm predict, uh, farm predict model are generally the best models. There are some exceptions, and these exceptions seem to be actually very relevant for the debates of today. In particular, there is the price uh, block, which seems to be better predicted by a sparse regression. It's one of you know, a big exception in this uh, large database of, of Stock and Watson. And here, I think it's a nice question, would be a nice question to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, probably one can go like Marcelo was doing in his first empirical application on the stock prices and understand a little bit more uh, specifically what's happening there because of the relevance of, uh, you know, forecasting inflation right now. Now, let me go through two a little bit more substantial points and then I will close the discussion. The first one is really a bit of an anatomy of the uh, results in this uh, second empirical application uh, on the Stock and Watson database. And here I will focus on just on IP, although, you know, the work of Marcel and Coders is really on all forecasting all the variables, but I focus on one because I want to show some charts. And then I will talk a little bit more about uh, uh, potential development of the methodology. So the data are basically the data of the first empirical application of uh, Marcelo. They are taken from our paper, uh, what we call the macro one application. So it's 130 predictors. The sample we use is the one uh, in the paper. So January 60 to December 2014. What I do is to estimate a dynamic factor model with four factors using principal component. And then I look at the idiosyncratic components. So what I'm showing here is three panels. On the left, leftmost panel, these are uh, the uh, lead or lags at which the idiosyncratic of IP uh, industrial production has a, a maximal correlation 
with the other 130 variables. And what you can see, so on the left hand, uh, so on the, on the vertical line, you read the lead lag, and uh, on the horizontal line is the number of variables. You can see that they're actually extremely uh, um, heterogeneous lead lag relationships. And actually, most of the time, the top correlation is not at the, uh, not at the uh, contemporaneous uh, level. And these are very different uh, levels of correlation. So the, the central and the rightmost uh, panel show you the value of the max absolute correlation compared on the, on the rightmost panel to the uh, absolute correlation at time zero, so contemporaneous correlation. You see that actually the differences are really large. So it's really important for this farm predictive model not to capture only the um, contemporaneous correlation, but also this correlation and lead their lags across idiosyncratics. Now, initially, I was a bit fooled by the notation in the paper, and I thought that the farm predictive model was only looking at the lasso regression on the contemporaneous uh, uh, variables. But when you look at the empirical application and also at the, at the type of uh, you know, covariance matrices that they, they use in the inferential theory, then it's clearer that what they're really thinking is that these idiosyncratics are really sort of sparse VARs, if you want. Now, the question for Marcelo, uh, because I, I didn't get it uh, by reading the paper, is also to understand to which extent how much of this uh, correlation is really allowed by the inferential theory. So I thought that uh, here, in this idiosyncratic part, we're really thinking about uh, relatively weak correlations. These correlations are not weak and are also very strong over the, uh, over the lag. So what is really allowed? Uh, let me, it's, a, it's something that did, I didn't get uh, out uh, as an intuition. So let me also show you that uh, uh, the variable between 80 and 100, this is the, uh, the uh, interest rate uh, uh, block of the Stock and Watson database are particularly correlated with IP. Now these variables are not just particularly correlated with IP. Here I'm showing you a matrix in colors. These are the uh, variables of the uh, in interest rate block. Red means that there is a cross correlation across variables which goes above 0 0.5, yellow between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5, white under 0 0.1. And you see the touch of these variables, even after taking the factor model, are very cross correlated. Some of them really, you know, two levels of correlation which uh, are close to, to one almost. Now, why this is irrelevant? And here I'm plotting uh, those idiosyncratic components of those variables. So you can see this commonality, although there is also a lot of idiosyncrasies. Now, why do I want to plot that? Well, because in our paper that Marcelo kindly mentioned a few times, we show that in this case, in case there is a large correlation across uh, variables, really you cannot tell which one of these variables is more relevant to predict uh, a certain variable. So this actually should apply also for this methodology, this farm predicting methodology. Uh, in principle, what one should do to really exploit uh, for, uh, the whole uh, predictive power of these variables is to look at uh, all potential models, including all of these variables and combine them. You know, in, in the paper, we call it uh, a sort of BMA approach. So what I'm, this is even more relevant if you look at density forecasting. So two suggestions for, uh, for uh, Marcelo and co-authors, maybe for the next paper, is to think about uh, this uh, uh, new part of the farm predicting model in these terms. So not just thinking about lasso, but thinking at methodologies that can actually capture also this, uh, if you want, model uncertainty, and maybe extend toward looking at density forecasting. Now, if uh, one of the great uh, uh, contributions of this paper is the inferential theory. If it is too difficult to go to the inferential theory uh, via this uh, full-blown model uncertainty approach, maybe you can consider something which is a little bit closer to what you already have, for example, group lasso, uh, that would uh, potentially help you having, uh, you know, maybe more sparsity in terms of the groups, but less sparsity inside the groups where you have uh, uh, similar variables. Probably this is close enough that you can uh, already use your uh, way of thinking about inferential theory and maybe capture also this property of the data. So let me conclude. I really love this paper. It's very close to my research. It gave me really, you know, uh, huge inspiration uh, as well as, Ma as, uh, as Marcelo said about our paper. I think the main contribution of the paper is really this inferential theory, which is badly needed. And uh, I also said it uh, 
uh, about the contribution of Eric uh, to the literature. In this uh, literature close to big data and machine learning, we need more and more of this inferential theory because we need to have a comfort that what we are doing is going to work in you know, very many uh, situations and not just on the empirical applications that we see in the paper. And Marcelo's work is really going in that direction. And if you want, my discussion was just opening a bit of the black, bo black box of the results and trying to see where Marcelo and Kotos could go in the next uh, uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Wonderful discussion, as always. Thanks so much. Uh, Marcelo, wh why don't you take a yeah. little bit of time to, to no. respond? Yeah. Well, first, thank you so much uh, for the kind words and the lovely discussion. Um, uh, let me uh, try to address all, 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 all the points. First, non-stationarity. Uh, this point uh, appears uh, on our companion paper that we do like this counterfactual. It was one of the points of the referees because this literature usually is usually on, on non-stationary data. Okay, so we basically, we overcame the problem in a very simple way. Basically, wow, take our first differences and run the methodology on first differences, and then you can integrate back your, your variables, and then everything works fine, okay? Um, of course, if you have, uh, and, and I think that's the beauty, because that, that was an apl applied paper, okay? In terms of theory, uh, the, I think the beauty of the methods that we write uh, the estimation of each stage depending on, on the estimation rates of the previous stage, okay? So if now we have a, a, a better uh, ways, better ways to have the technology to estimate factors with non-stationary data, we can use that on the second stage. And our requirement is to have uh, the idiosyncratics to be stationary, right? The idiosyncratics not being stationary will be a pain in the neck because uh, then all this lasso theory for non-stationary data, things get really, really ugly. And, and again, the whole inference uh, on the covariance matrix, because you don't even know how to define an object, uh, a covariance of a non-stationary geosyncratics, okay? But as long as that after you filter the factors, you get some, you get stationary uh, idiosyncratics, then it's fine. It's just a matter to adapt the second stage or the first stage, where you're going to take in, take uh, into account the the stochastic trend. Okay, uh, so I think we can do. Uh, I think it's it's it's, it's not a a, a a a big deal. Okay, uh, concerning the macro application, I really loved your discussion because every time I present that. Uh, people are silent about the macro application. They talk about a lot about the financial application, but that's about the first input that we really uh, got, the strong input that we got on, on the macro application. And yes, we have to open the black box there because uh, to understand uh, what's going on. One thing that I, we notice that whenever PCR is a good forecasting model and PCR uh, beats the uh, is sparse regression, then farm predict improves even further, as you mentioned. So it, it's great. So it, it's even, there's something even on the top of, of, of density. So you can interpret that as more, more density, right? And, and sparsity is really good whenever, when you expect sparsity like stock returns. But, uh, but again, prices, we, we have uh, uh, to open the black box. The problem that we are following the, the notation by, by the Fred MD. And in price, they're not only inflation data, but you have oil, oil prices. We have to open this and see, to look at the inflation data separate from, from oil prices, okay? So, um, then you ask about, okay, if you have like this lead lag correlation, what, can we handle that? Okay, and, and in fact, you're right. We, we, I think we wrote the paper like more into uh, a, a cross section thing and, and then but letting the dynamics and it, for us like writing it out, that's obvious that we can put a VAR on the sta third stage 
but people got confused. Referees got confused. So one of the one thing that we have to the, the referee asked for the revision is that we have to make the third stage uh, explicit. That's a VAR. So it will be a VAR. It's a high dimension VAR on the third stage. If you want to do forecasting, okay. If you want to do the the financial application, then you don't need the VAR. But for the macro, definitely you need. So what's the conditions that we need there in terms of sparsity? You can have uh, slow decaying uh, autocorrelations. Of course, you cannot have long memory, uh, but you can have dependence. And we cannot have much of this cross dependence. Like the cross, we need some sparsity there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that, that we need uh, because, uh, and uh, ways to, it's not, we don't need the kind of irrepresentable conditions because we are not doing model selection, but some sparsity we need, otherwise we don't know what we are estimating. Uh, so one way we're, to do we're, these we're, things is like the, the, the group lasso. Yeah, sparse group lasso would be not, not uh, that would, exp the work with Andre, Bobby and yeah. uh, Jonas Triokas, uh, sparse yeah. group lasso would, recognizes the time series um, dependent structure. Yeah. I hate to interrupt you because we are actually running over time. Okay. Um, so what I would like to suggest is that we conclude here the recorded part just by saying that we will have one more uh, uh, webinar on June the 6th. It will be hosted by uh, Katia Smetanina. Uh, and it will uh, feature uh, Emmy Nakamura from UC Berkeley uh, and Richard Crumb from the Fed as discussants. Uh, with that, I would like to end uh, the recording and those who want to join for the informal chat, please stay on the Zoom session. Thank you.